Babes Behind the Beats with just Bowen and Bowie J. Well, hello, it's Bowie Jane here, and we have Jess Bowen. So we're obviously, we're babes behind the beats, here for your listening pleasure. That is us. Now, today we have a really cool guest, Inaya Day, and she's a dance music artist. She's had so many hits. House music's been her thing, and she's been a really prominent top liner. Her vocal's been used in heaps of dance tracks. Yeah, actually, we should talk about this, Bowie, because I feel like some people maybe don't know what top lining is. I actually was talking to Lauren about this the other day, and she was like, what? as a top liner like I've never heard that before yeah it's interesting I think it's kind of recent maybe the last 10, 10 years or 10 something. 10 years or something. And I even feel like when I first started writing with my band, The Summer 7, we would all write together. I don't even think we knew what top lining was. I think we just figured we were writing together and didn't know. Top lining is like putting a vocal, like a melody in the lyrics to something, like a track that's maybe already produced. The top liner is coming up with those like melodies and those lyrics. Yeah, that. that's right. It's like the top line is exactly what it says. I guess the top line yeah. sitting on top of a track. Uh, I was talking to Jason, our producer, about this, and he thinks things maybe it was because of the internet and maybe people do more co-writes online now uh-huh. um, and back in the day you'd all be sitting in a room together writing the songs but now it's like can you put a top line on this already produced track which right. happens a lot for dance music oh yeah because for dance music you've got the people that are just really honing in on making that track right yeah for you I know you do a little bit of everything but I feel like you really were focusing a lot before at least on the vocal right yeah that was your thing we were writing in Sweden and London and that's when we first heard of about really the use of the word top line was very prominent over there. And they were doing a lot of top lines for K-pop and J-pop in oh. Korea and Japan. So the, a lot of the British writers and the Swedish writers are writing for Japan and Korea. But the track comes in and they're putting the top line on or vice versa. It depends. Like yeah. obviously some things need to be in Japanese and Korean lyrics fit. Yeah. <laughs> so then at that point, were you mostly doing like then just like the melodies? For instance, when you were in Sweden, if you were writing for K-pop or something, were you just kind of coming up with those top line melodies then? Yeah. So Jason was producing the track. So he would be producing a track to a form which would suit that band in Korea or Japan. And then we would put a vocal on top, which would sort of be the rhythm of Japanese or Korean vocals. Oh, that's cool. But we weren't saying anything. Like right. we were doing mumbo jumbo. Like yes. And trying to be in a rhythm that we thought would fit with the song <laughs> and then they had to com- basically put lyrics put the lyrics it. there, yeah. So the yeah. top line, I guess, was the melody. And yeah. yeah. Then we put the track to them as well. Yeah, that's so interesting because I feel like some people, maybe if they're just getting into music or they're just not familiar with what a top liner does. Yeah. I mean, everyone in the creative process is crucial, but you need that top line. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's your hook. <laughs> Especially in COVID with people doing heaps of co-writes online, I guess now there's a huge element of that. Someone sends a track, you put a vocal on it, yeah. And you send it back to them. Do you like that melody? Do you like those lyrics? It's so interesting how things change. And obviously different genres are, it, it could be different. I mean, yeah. when our band first started writing music, again, this is when we were in our teens, it literally was sitting in a room with our instruments, playing music and just being like, oh, okay, I have this guitar part, play a drum beat to this. And yeah. then like the lyrics would come after, the vocals would come after. It's kind of like you lay down the music and then you try and like everyone would come together and try to top line. Yeah, I it feel was like that's a, a bad Band thing. Like, it's a band yeah. thing. Yeah. But I mean, of course, I know there's obviously bands that the lead singer really does just take that initiative, that control. When you're a singer, you're inclined to do that, though, yeah. too. That's your instrument, is your voice. Yeah. And so, top lining, that comes naturally, I feel like, to most singers. There's, again, a lot of musicians can top line but I, I think it naturally comes to a singer no you're right because also that emotion that's going to match the lyric if you're singing it it has to be from you inside exactly so, yeah. yeah or whichever artist you're writing for right yeah yeah exactly. I think you want it to have something that's relatable or like an experience and it's something that people want to know what you like if you were doing that top line it's like oh I want to know like what were you feeling and I think you can really tell when when it's authentic as we like. <laughs> <laughs> actually an interesting fact did you know Sia with the track Titanic she was always popular, but she wasn't worldwide known. Well, she started as a writer. But, and she was more indie music in Australia. But interestingly, that song, Titanium, she was writing for other artists. David Getham, I think he might have produced the track. She puts the top line on and records her vocal for it just as a demo. And they decided that they preferred that The vo- demo That version? vocal, yeah. That, oh, wow. So they preferred that. And so they ended up releasing that track. And she was like, oh, my God, but I didn't sing that. Like, that's for another artist. That's crazy. Was that... 
the song that started her career then as an yeah. artist? Yeah. On the worldwide scale. Like she was already, you know, a strong performer right. and all that kind of stuff. And she was gigging and all that and releasing her own music, but definitely not in dance style. Yeah. And so, yeah, when that track released, she got huge. And I was like, whose vocal is that? That sounds like an Italian vocal or something. Then I found out she's Australian. I'm like, what? Yeah. She is amazing. I love Sasha. Yeah, it's wild great. to me that she actually was someone who didn't want to be on stage, which is why she did the whole get up, right? Where like yeah. you wouldn't see her face because she didn't want that life for her. Yeah. Someone like Lady Gaga, same type of thing. You start off behind the scenes yeah. being a writer and then it's like all of a sudden you're the star, you're on stage. I it's know. crazy. Crazy. I do love Sia though. He loved her vocals. So they just wanted to use that instead of someone else's. They're like, you know what? We're not going to sell this track. We actually want to use your vocal. Well, hopefully she's not mad at that because that's a oh, huge, that just it made her blow up. She would have gone from, you know, only just surviving music with money to yeah. being fully rich. Oh, she's, <laughs> yeah. She could quit now and be fine just off that song. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that leads into the fact that we have Inaya Day on today and you are going to love hearing about her story. She's from Brooklyn, like some of our other guests. She's really, really experienced in the dance music scene, so we just can't wait to chat with her. She's had number ones, multiple number ones, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Let's chat with Let's do Inaya. It. I am beyond excited today to chat with our next guest, one of the greatest top dance club artists of all time, and that's as described by Billboard and as described by me. Seriously, you'll be amazed at the career Inaya Day has had. From working with Frankie Knuckles, Louis Vega, Queen Latifah and P. Diddy, you will mostly know her from her number one Billboard dance hit, Horny with Moose T and Nasty Girl or Nasty Nasty Girl, as us Aussies pronounce it. She has her own record label and is friends with Dean Robinson, so is therefore a friend of mine. Welcome, Inaya Day. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we're so excited. I mean, you are such a legend in the house music scene. There are so many tracks that I didn't realise you were the vocal on. And one of those is like recently Rock the Mic, which I play every single set. I didn't realise that was your vocal. I can't believe it. I'm stoked. <laughs> wow, awesome. Thanks for playing it. I yeah. love that song, by yeah, the way. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a cool groove and it, it fits into every situation. So, yeah, so excited. But what I'm interested in is you're born and bred Brooklyn, right? Yes. Okay. And how did you get into house music? Was house music always big in Brooklyn or what was that journey for you to get into house music? Yeah, house music was always big in New York. For me, when I was a kid, someone played some house music for me and they were like, look, there's this new music coming out. And they played it and we were like, whoa, and we were dancing to it, you know, mm -hmm. with kids like <laughs> So <laughs> I started doing a lot of uh, house music demos because everybody wanted to produce songs like this so-called new style of music. So they would have me sing different demos and things like that. And I just loved, loved house music, but I wasn't old enough to go to the clubs to hear it. So I only knew what I heard on the radio. And at that time, house music was just music and it would come on the radio and I was able to hear it that way. So I didn't really know many of the club tunes until way later when I was able to go to the club when I aged in. And at that time, my friends and and I would always go to this club in New York City called Nell's. It's now shut down, but it's legendary. Stevie Wonder would drop by, Prince dropped by, wow. um, so many people. And we used to listen to house music downstairs all the time. We would do, we thought we were amazing. We would do floor work. You know, we thought we were just it now that we were old enough to get in. And we were like, oh, we already know this music. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. But how did they find you? Like, how do they know, hey, this girl can sing? Obviously, you're in the clubs and you're liking the music and you've grown up on the music, kind of. Even though people thought it was new, you knew about it. Well, of course, I started in church and then I started in, then I went on to um, musical theatre. And then from musical theatre, I started to record with Moose T and Oris, etc. But before that, I would just do demos for different R&B producers who wanted to get 
into house. I had a group of tracks, but I would never let them put it out because at that time they were funny about blurring the lines. And, you know, if you were doing hip hop and R&B, you're doing hip hop and R&B, you know, so I left it at that. It was fun. I did the demos, did the sessions, got my coins and (laughs) it was all good. I moved to Germany in 1995 to do a show called Broadway Dusseldorf, who was put up by Andrew Lloyd Webber's oh, people. Wow. The show oh was God. by Andrew Lloyd Webber's That's people. huge. Yeah, I did Broadway Dusseldorf. And wow. then the people from Little Shop of Horrors saw me at that show and asked me if I would do their show. And I said, well, is your show in German? And they were like, yeah. I said, well, I don't speak any German. And they said, yeah, but we believe you will learn this and oh. you will do this. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, Okay, I'll do it. And the co-director of that show, which was a little shop of horrors, but we did it in German, so it was called Der Kleine Horrorladen. We did a Kleine Horrorladen, and Yilmaz said he had a friend named Boris, and he's telling Boris, I have a friend named Anaya. You guys should get together. And we're both like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> but to appease him, I rode four hours on the train to meet Boris Lugosh and Musti. <gasps> um, they told me the direction that they wanted me to go, like, you know, sing something positive, like, no matter what happens, eventually. Eventually, things will be all right. Sure. So I kept singing a bunch of hooks until I came around to keep pushing on. Things are good. And when I got up to that, they were like, keep going, keep going. So I just built from that and just sang the whole song from the top of my head. And that was the beginning of my official house music career. Yeah. How does that happen to to come up with a great line, but to write a whole song? My gosh. Yeah. And you know, the cool thing is that I never put pen to paper. It's all just church stuff that (laughs) was on the top of my head. So uh, it says, though the mountain seems too high and the valley low and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. I just kept going. Yeah, it worked out. (laughs) Wow, that's impressive. And so you moved to Germany. That's a little bit of a big move from, this is in the 90s, is it? Or you're moving to Germany and you can't speak German. Not, I mean, they can all speak English, so it's cool. But (laughs) that's a big move and an exciting move, I imagine, at the time. Yes, I had a gig in Belgium. Well, George Faison, who is the first African-American to win a Tony Award for a Broadway show. He put up a show around me. Oh my God. We oh. did that. <laughs> yeah, we did that in Belgium. And then after that, he drove me from Belgium to Germany and made sure I had Deutschmarks in my pocket, Deutschmarks at the time. It was yeah. 1995 and I moved to Germany. I didn't know anybody in that city. I knew people in Cologne and in Bochum, but not in Dusseldorf, wow. which is where I lived for, for one year. And then I moved to Cologne And then I lived in Bochum for three years. Wow. So, yeah. Incredible that you got a show written around you. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, wow. It was fun. Okay, so you're in Germany. What was your next step from Germany? Because I think it's fascinating that you've already been worldwide at this point. So where did you move from the Germany musical theatre scene to moving into, I guess, the club scene? Well, um, once I met Musti and Boris, I laid the song down. I basically went again to you just make Yomas happy. And I'm like, yeah, so just pay me for the session. I have four hours to ride back to Dusseldorf. I want to get going. So I go back to Dusseldorf. I pay it no mind. I go home to New York on hiatus and I'm in my room, my bedroom, vacuuming the carpet. And 98.7 Kiss comes on and it says, Kiss, Master Mix. Keep pushing on. No, oh my God. Yeah, and I'm like, that sounds familiar. I know (laughs) this one. And I'm dancing to it, not realizing it's me. And then when it gets to, don't the mountain seem too high? I said, hold up, that's me. And I ran out and I was like, Ma, I'm on the radio. Ma, I'm on the radio. And she called my aunts and everything. She's excited. She's telling them, turn on 98.7. And I is on the radio. Oh, my <laughs> God. It was incredible. Yeah. And then I realized it and I'm just like, wait a minute, I'm on the radio. That's in my huge. mind, that was a demo, you know? <gasps> wow. So, Wherever I go when I'm working with people uh, doing any recording, I have them sign a collaboration agreement. So that way I protect myself so nothing can be done without my consent. So they forgot that they signed that. And um, I called them with my attorney on three-way. And I was, I was like, Boris, I just heard the song on the radio. What's up with that? And they're like, Inayo, vas los? Like, you know, what's the matter? Mm-hmm. And I said, 
uh, remember that paper you signed? And he's like, no. I said, I do. I have a copy right here. I said, as a matter of fact, I have someone I want you to talk to. His name is Wayne Rooks. And then he stepped in and took over and we sussed it out, made it all even. And we were great ever since. (laughs) Fantastic. So you you knew to get that contract signed very early on because of that, I guess. Yes, indeed. That's that's interesting to me because I feel like for listeners who are maybe interested in going into the music industry or don't know about that, did you come up with that yourself to like have this thing signed before anything went out? Or did someone tell you you should do that? Because I feel like some people might not know that that's a good way to protect yourself, right? Or like legal matters. I'm lucky because I all I've ever done is music. I'm a musical theater baby. I've been in musical theater professionally since I was 12 years old. Mm. So I've had the same attorney since I was 12 years old. And he's always looked out for me. He's always told me, listen, when you go sing for people, make sure you get some paper. I'll draw something up and you just have them just scratch something on it. It's real simple. It's a one page. And uh, that way, at least you have something to go back to if something goes awry. (laughs) That's that's (laughs) great. I'm like, okay. (laughs) No, that's really great to know. Again, for the listeners that, you know, I know a lot of even friends of mine out here in LA that are doing top line stuff or just getting into the music industry that wouldn't think, think a lot of people feel like, oh, you know, you just trust who you're working with, which is, of course, you want to trust people, but you also, I think you have to have that safety, which sounds like was great that you have had this amazing attorney since you were 12 that is looking out for you as well. You got to look out for yourself, you know? Yes. Yes, indeed. Definitely can't trust anyone. <laughs> really. And not trust anyone you know, or everyone. <laughs> just so you want to make sure right. your minds are aligned. That's what they say with legal documents. So you want to make sure or, hey, if there are any issues, what do you think? Are we both on the same page with this? Work it out from day one. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. And, you know, um, to be fair, there was no ill intent. It's just that I guess they were used to hiring someone to come in. They thought that I would do work for hire, and we don't use work for hire language. We don't do that because things come back up, and they would get paid, and I would get nothing. No, it doesn't make sense. And why would I forfeit something that I created? So, in all fairness, I'm sure many other people with whom they worked accepted those terms or that's what they were used to. That was their norm. So I don't think they even thought about it. That's why when I gave, gave Boris Lugosh the paper and he signed it, he was just like, eh, whatever. He didn't pay any attention to it because it's like, eh, we're doing the song. We paid her for the session and we're good. Wow. So I don't think he understood that you need to read that paperwork. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's huge. Wow. So you went to yeah. um, high school of performing arts in New York. Is that right? Yep. High School of Music and the Performing Arts. Okay. It's the fame school. The yeah. fame school. Yes. I mean, I only know it, I guess, from the movie, but I'm not really familiar with it. But but I know it's super famous, right? This is like just for performing. Like what an incredible experience for you to go to high school doing that. Is that really what it was? Just solely performing? Um, No, it, it's a regular high school with a focus on your art. Uh-huh. Um, we do. We have visual art, drama, instruments and voice. So, oh, and dance. So the focal point is your art, but we're taught everything else, of course, the reading, writing, arithmetic part of it. <laughs> but um, they take the art very seriously. And many famous people have come out of there, like Diane Carroll, Billy D. Williams, so many. Um, Chaz, Cher's son. Oh, yes. Chaz Bono. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Chastity was in my class. Just being an Australian, I can't imagine what it's like, A, growing up in New York or just in any performing school. I'm so jealous. What an experience. Amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. And it was so much like the movie. Jennifer Aniston was also in my class. <gasps> no. What? Yeah. It, there are a lot of us. Wow. <laughs> there are a lot of us. Yeah. I mean, you're also like-minded then. That's cool, isn't it? Not like you're the odd one out because you're doing the arts. Everyone's doing the Everyone's arts. Everyone's doing it. Yeah. I mean, many of us are, but some people did it then and they may have done a couple of things after and then they were like, okay, let me get this state job. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, kind of did it for their time and then decided like, well, I'm going to go a different route or a different path. Well, I have to have that security because to stay in this business, you got to be a little crazy because yeah. it's not easy. The ebbs and flows can drive people nuts. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we've been finding. Obviously with coronavirus, the ebbs and flows of the business are all over the shop at the moment. So we've both lost all our gigs. Lost them in March, our whole year was 
is unbooked. <laughs> As everyone has yeah. Yeah, in this industry. So you I'm know? wondering, you would have had a heap of stuff booked and all unbooked as well. Yes. As a matter of fact, I was due to tour Australia and New Zealand <gasps> with an orchestra doing house music. Oh my God. No. That yep, I was supposed to be there in, in all of August. Oh, and with an orchestra, that would be That epic. would be so amazing. But, you know, hopefully when this thing leans off, we can uh, pick it up again. Hope it'll come to fruition. My band is just flat out. We had so many gigs. I have like a few toward the end of the year, but every two weeks we get a notice. Okay, this has been pushed to 2021. Okay, this has been pushed to 2021. And yeah. it's like, you know. It's- That's what I was going to ask if you knew if anything was rescheduled for sure. But yeah, of course, everyone's probably has the tentative 2021 dates of here's yes. the reschedule, but who knows? At that time, we'll have to maybe reassess at that point too. It's yeah. crazy. And I'm lucky to have the access to equipment so I can perform these live streams streams. I've done so many live streams and they're gracious enough to give me a little something for it. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. So are you doing this on Twitch or the live streams are more festival style? How is that being done? I've performed for for some festivals. Um, They ask me if I'd like to do whatever. And then I say, sure. And then they request the song and I record it and video it simultaneously live for quality calls so that when they put it on, they don't have to worry about glitches. I'm on video and on mic. (laughs) Oh my God. Wow. Sometimes green screen and ah, (laughs) singing in the house. That's (laughs) so cool. So that's just like adapting with the times, right? It's doing something that you probably haven't had to do before, but all right, this is what we got to do now for putting on a live show, I guess. (laughs) That's it. You got to do it. And the festivals online have been great. I got to do a duet virtually with the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. And we did a song called Singing for Our Lives. It's a remake. We did that like two weeks ago and it was amazing. Um, Billy Porter was on that program, as was Alex Newell. Kristen Chenoweth spoke and it was awesome. People are still talking about it. So uh, I think they're going to make it into a full on record because um, it got such a great response. Oh, oh wow. my God. Response. How can, epic. Can our listeners find that online somewhere right now? Or is it something that was broadcasted and is now something that's not on yeah, was the it internet? Live? Yeah. Yeah, you can find it on Facebook and you can find it on, I think it's sfgmc.com, that San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. Yeah, and when you go there, I guess you would look up videos or whatever and and it should be there, but it's definitely on Facebook. Oh, amazing. I'm definitely going to be looking at that after we get off this this interview. (laughs) I'm very excited. And... Just on Tuesday, August 25th, is Frankie Knuckles Day. So for Frankie Knuckles Day, I was the last artist with whom he worked before he passed away. Got through six songs for my project before he left us. We did a song together called Let's Stay Home. And they asked me to sing that on Tuesday for Frankie Knuckles Day. So I performed that live online as well. You can find that. I'm also going to post it, just that my segment, so that people don't have to um, skim through the whole event. But the whole event is pretty well, pretty good. But I'm going to post that too. And you can find that online as well. I have one coming up, the Master Beat. I did one with them at the beginning of the pandemic because we did a song together called One World. And I performed that earlier. On and I think in April, early April or late March. And now they've come back and asked me to sing a song I did called Moving Up, Take My Problems to the Dance Floor. And I'm going to do a duet with Leva, who is a <sighs> performance artist. You know, he dresses up and puts these things on his head and all this makeup and he looks fabulous and he dances his butt off. He has choreographed my shows a few times. We're going to do a duet. He's going to lip sync as I sing some of the parts. Oh, and it's really cool. That is so. So awesome. I oh love my God. That. I cannot wait for that. Sunday, this Sunday. This at, Sunday. Uh, uh, September 6th. I think it's, yeah, 7 p.m. LA time, Pacific Coast time. And um, it's going to be 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oh, we will definitely post about that. Now, I assume you'll be able to get it afterwards as well. So. Yeah, will it be able to be viewed afterwards as well? Yes, indeed. Yes. I really wanted to touch on that as well. Your work with Frankie Knuckles, who is just so well known, oh, beyond well known in the 
DJ house scene. How did that come about that you were working with Frankie? Yeah, he's the godfather of house, actually. And yeah. he was also like a big brother, you know, a big brother to me. And I was working with this, um, well, I was about to work with this DJ producer who said he would produce my album, right? And he took a while and I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, rock when you're ready. And he goes, oh, Anaya, unless my name is next to your name as the artist and my co-artist, then you will have to pay me 700 per track and da 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 And he wasn't even famous. And I'm like, uh, but you said you were going to do it. And he's like, yeah, but things have changed. And, you know, it I, it will be $700. I said, okay, thanks. And I just never said anything else to him. I told Frankie about it. We were on the phone one night. And I said, yeah, you know what so-and-so did to me? Blah, 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 blah. And he said, baby girl, why didn't you just ask me? And I said, because you're Frankie Knuckles and you're busy. And he was like, I'm not too busy for you. He was like, matter of fact, hang up, hang up. I got something for you. And he worked on something. He had something he was working on and he kind of zhuzhed it up, sent it to me. And I heard it and I called him back. I said, whoa, this track is hot. And he said, you think you want to do something to it? I said, heck yeah. And matter of fact, hang up, hang up, hang up. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this song called Let's Stay Home. And uh, I said, oh, because I, I heard it. I was like, that song would go great with this track. So I brought it back and I altered it to fit Frankie's track, changed it around a bit, added some words, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I made a rough demo on GarageBand, sent it to Frankie. He called me back and said, whoa, we got to put this out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. From that guy quoting his price way too high or quoting a price at all, quite frankly. <laughs> You've, uh, you have you ended up working with Frankie Knuckles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? And, you know, we had no each other forever and we called each other the birthday twins because his birthday is January 18th and mine is January 17th ah. and in fact his last birthday in Chicago, we spent it together. I sang. He was supposed to come down and DJ, but he didn't feel well. So we went upstairs and they brought us a cake and it had both our faces on it. So his last birthday, was spent. we spent it together. We Aww. celebrated together. So that was a blessing. Yeah, that's beautiful. Amazing to have those memories with him. Yeah. And, yeah. and sad as well, I imagine. Totally. You've since then started your own record label and you've had some huge hits, but what drove you to, to start your own record label. We're interested to know as a female, you studying your own label is a big deal. So how did that come about? That happened because I was tired of being at the behest of other people. I never wrote music to copy anyone else's. When I did Keep Pushing, I just sang off of the top of my head. I loved house music. I knew what came on the radio or what I heard in Nels or whatever. But I wasn't super, super well-versed in house music. I did what felt good to me. And I did what I heard, not following any trend or trying to be like anyone else. So I still write that way. I try. Once in a while, I don't because the producers say, can you give me a track like this one? And they send me a link. Can you do something like this person? Which I hate, but I mean, okay, if that's what you want, great. You know. Yeah. So I got tired of making music that I believed in that the labels did not. And I knew it was good. So I was like, if they have a label, I can have a label. Exactly. So I called I call my good old lawyer and I said, Wayne, I want to start a record label. What do I have to do? And he walked me through it. Uh, he said, I'm going to set up your business bank account now and blah, 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 blah. He did everything and on that end and told me what to do on my end, like getting my ISRC code and all that stuff. I did all of that and boom, there it is. So when I don't want to give it to someone else or... Or I can't find a, a grabber. I put it out myself. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. have to wait for anyone. How cool is that? And that's the thing is I think people go, oh, record label. It's like to release it myself. I know when I had to release my own music and they're like, what label? And I'm like, shit, it's myself. What the fuck? So I'm like, oh, and I just made up a name, B BME. We're releasing it under BME label. <laughs> and I was like, what does that even mean? Really, it's just a name. There's not much to it. Yes, you need your ISRC 
codes. It's not as scary as people think, I don't think. What and do you think? All, not yeah. at all. It's not so hard. I mean, you, you put the ISRC codes and, you, you know, all that stuff next to the tracks and, uh, you know, you fill out your metadata form and send it in to your aggregator, your distributor. And yeah, and then you own them it. About it. <laughs> Did you want to start a record label to have DJ or anyone like in the house industry or females like oh, top lining, anything like that? Or were you focusing mostly on just having it so that you could release things that you wanted to for yourself without having to worry about other people? I really wanted it for myself and not having to worry about other people. But I have family members and friends who sing and stuff like that. So I wanted to also be a help to them. And if they wanted to put something out, I was like, bet, let's do it. Yeah. You know, I have my cousin Bond. I put uh, maybe three or four of her songs out on my label. My friend Tony Seawright, who also manages me, I put a couple of songs out on Tony. And this is a while back, though. And I put a song out for my friend Wallace. I actually did the duet with him of Any Love. It's a remake of Any Love by Shaka Khan. My friend Rasul, you know. Yeah. I, I'm like, sure, I'll put it out. It doesn't have to be a big, grandiose name. It could be your own initials. Guy Shiman, we released three songs together so far, and we're working on the next act actually. And he lives in Israel and is born and bred there. We work together and he said, I'm going to put it out on my label. And it's called Guy Shiman Music. He just calls it GSM. See? And wow. Wow. Yep, that's what it's all about. So, and I, I have to ask you, my, my girlfriend would hate me if I did not ask you about this. And I also would hate myself if I didn't ask you because you were on Broadway doing The Wiz, correct? <laughs> yeah, I um funny story. When I was a little kid, we saw the R and B artist Stephanie Mills and she's the original Dorothy in The Wiz. Yeah. And we saw her toward the end of their run and looked up at my mother and said, I wanna be in the Wiz, even if I'm just Stephanie Mills understudy. And then years later, when I was in my 20s, I wound up being Stephanie Mills' understudy in the revival of The Wiz. No. Oh my God. That's incredible. Yeah. That's just putting that yeah. out into the universe and just getting what you ask for. Totally. Totally. And I auditioned for it and didn't know it because, again, George Faison, who had won the Tony Award for The Wiz for the choreography, he knows me. So he said, can you come over here and sing home? And and be a lion. And I said, sure, because he always had me coming over there doing stuff and he put shows up and he would draft me in, you know. So he said, can you come over here and sing home and be a lion? I was like, yeah. He said, can you come tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. So I came and then there's uh, this man, Tony, he was on the piano and he was like, oh, hi, you ready to sing? And I was like, sure. And then I was like, well, why are they being so formal? And George sat there and I sang uh, Be a Lion. Then I sang Home. He said, oh, no, oh, no, I'll be right back. He goes in the back. He makes a call to the production company. They had hired or was they were going to hire someone else or something like that. I'm not clear on it. And I heard him say, well, you come here this child and tell her she don't have the job. And I'm like, huh? well, maybe he ain't talking about me. So I didn't paid it no attention and we went on with our lives right so a few days later i receive a giant envelope and i open it up and it has this thick contract and it says theater under the stars blah 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 yada yada the whiz and i'm like huh and i call my friend victor who is also like a brother with me and i and i go vic do you know anything about this whiz thing what is this he said george Faison. that's why you went to sing for him you're understudying stephanie mills i was like what I didn't even know. Oh my oh God. Oh my God. That's so cool. Yeah. So what was that experience like? Because you had obviously seen her on stage and then you were like understudying her. Like walk us through that whole experience. Yeah. We were in rehearsal and they would always say, please don't bother Miss Mills. Please don't bother Miss Mills. So we kind of like stayed away, you know. George Faison, he's very passionate about what he does, especially when it comes to direction and choreography. And he would yell and yell and rave and rant. And, you know, because he knows me and I'm like one of his kids, I call him my brother, Uncle Dad. Mm. So he's harder on me. <laughs> and he was like, what are you doing? Kick your leg, point your feet. Ah! And he's just staring into me. And then we go on break and I'm sitting in the back, you know, my legs folded. And Stephanie Mills comes to the back of the uh, studio, the dance studio, and sits next to me. She said, you OK? And I said, yeah. She's like, why is he yelling at you like that? I was like, he always does. She was like, well, next time I'm just going to tell him I did it or I'll say something. Oh. I said, no, you don't have to. You don't have to do that. And from then on, we were 
Thick as Thieves. Oh, oh my God. That is amazing. That. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Wow. She spoke to me first. And after they were like, don't talk to Miss Mills. And, and I'm like, you making us seem like, you know, we're going to be over there asking for autographs. Isn't you know, that and I'm sure she was like, case. why isn't anybody talking to me? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. So do yeah. You, you had a good relationship with her then? Yeah, very much so. She, <sighs> she uh, actually, I learned a lot from her. She would just tell me things and give me little gems of wisdom <laughs> you know for the business and she was always very nice to me and whatever she did she included me if she was in concert she made sure I got in and always she was always nothing but nice to me and I we um, laid someone close to us mutually close to us to rest a couple of years ago and I saw her for the first time in a very long time we just stood there and hugged each other really tight mm, yeah she's really great people. Wow, that's amazing. You you build those relationships really early on. Okay, so Inaya, you've got your record label. Now, what are you doing for this year? Or I know this year is a shambles. So what what have you got planned for the next 12 months, if it's possible to plan at all? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I have these live performances lined up, thank God, on um, live stream. But um, during the pandemic, oddly enough, I filmed a video called Holding On to Hope on top of a roof, on a rooftop, away from everybody. Everything was sectioned off. The cameraman stayed away from me. Everybody just stayed away. And we filmed that, and it's about people just being hopeful during this whole thing. They, it shows people walking down the street with their masks on and wanting to embrace but really can't and but still we dance kind of thing. So that song has not been released. We only released the video and the video did so well that we knew we could take our time with the rest of the song, getting proper remixes and stuff like that. So holding on to hope is going to come soon. I have a lot of hope songs out right now. Of course, we need them as much as we can. So I've done people of the world with Guy Shiman and it says gotta have love, hope, peace, music in your body. So um, I did that with Richard Earnshaw and Ridney from the UK. I did a song called Alone 2020 with Gabri Venus of Italy. So I <laughs> have these people from all over the world doing music with them during the pandemic. And from Australia, speaking of my wonderful Aussies, yeah. um, my friend Greg Gould, who is from Australia's Got Talent. Yeah. Yes. He contacted me on Instagram last year and he says, hi, I'm Greg Gould and I love your music and blah, 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 blah. Would you do a duet with me? And I'm like, uh, and I said, what song are you thinking about? He said, well, my album's going to be called 1998 and I would love it if you would do uh, the Faith Evans song. I never knew there was a love like this before. I never knew there yep. was a, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, good. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I felt like I was being punked because I asked him, I said, I said, did someone tell you that my brother co-wrote that with Faith? Right. And he said, no. And I was like, yes, my brother co-wrote that with Faith Evans. His name is Sean Jamel Crawford. And if you look on the credits, it says S. Crawford. And he said, oh, my God, maybe we should get your brother on the record, too. And I said, unfortunately, my brother passed away. Wow. You know, yeah. So he said, oh, now we have to do it. And I knew that this was like, oh, I am destined to do this song with this dude. So we did Love Like This together. And then this year, the day after New Year's Day, January 2nd, I was in Sydney because I had performed in Sydney on January 1st. January 2nd, we made this video and it's amazing. It's like, I'm going to let you guys watch it. I'm I can't wait to Cannot see wait to, this. Yeah. This is amazing. All the universe is aligning for that. Yes. I mean, it was so weird. I thought he was like playing me. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to use this song because I know she'll say, yeah, because it's her brother. Oh. You know, that's kind of what I thought he was doing. I was like, this guy's a little fishy. I don't know. But he <laughs> really didn't know. And now he and I are fast friends. You know, we're tight. We talk all the time on what's app and everything and we're planning our next making our next plan of attack because we're going to do another song together and 
I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's going to be dope. Cannot wait for that. We're so excited. <laughs> I cannot hate and, it. And yeah. Love Like This is being remixed right now. So we have a bunch of remixes coming for Love Like This. And I'm working on a project of my own, which I've been working on for three years. This is the longest I've ever worked on any project. It's never taken me any amount of years to do anything. <laughs> but this has taken me three years. And it's a cover album of a famous artist, female artist. But I'm not going to tell anybody yet. All the songs are reimagined by me. They sound nothing like what they would have sounded. Like even in the introductions, you'll never know that that song is about to be sung. Wow. So so it's a female artist that has passed away or a female artist currently? She is current. Ooh. But I'm not gonna say. Hey. But she is a veteran. She's a veteran artist and she is an icon and um, yeah, it's Ooh. coming soon. I have I'm through I'm through mixing four songs and I have two more to record vocals to and I have to finish mixing the rest. It's going to be about seven songs, six or seven songs. So it should be really cool. Oh, wow. That's amazing. We can't wait to hear that. We'll just be waiting. And as soon as we hear, we're going to repost it on our page. Listeners, make sure you keep an eye on the page. <laughs> cannot wait. Yeah. <laughs> Now, in I, we end with a silly little quiz. You will be fine with it. Don't stress. But I heard you're a bit of a Jeopardy fan, so <laughs> you're not going to have any problems with this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First question from Jess. My first question is dogs or cats? Both. Fair. Very fair. We're always happy with that answer. Do you, do you yes. have animals of your own that you could tell us about? Yes, I have two cats. One named Peppy and one named <gasps> Mimi, Pomeranian named Sing Ye. So I'm like, I couldn't pick, you know. <laughs> I don't have Sing Ye anymore, sadly, but I do have Mimi and Peppy. <laughs> you, uh, that is, oh my God. That's, so you have a cat named Peppy. I have a dog that's literally right now we're in studio and he's Asleep. laying on like my leg named Pepe. And <laughs> and it's funny because Bowie always comes into the studio. And she, she calls him Peppy. That's what she loves calling him. And like, that's just her oh thing. When you said that, I was both of us looked at each other with wide eyes. Oh my God, because she calls him Peppy all the time because she just loves. <laughs> all right. Aww. Second question, whiskey or vodka? Vodka. Oh, yeah. Yes. Everybody, they buy me vodka as a gift. <laughs> oh my God. What's your vodka of yeah, choice? Yeah, what's your choice? Well, right now I'm on Tito's, but yes. um, next to that is Kettle One or Belvedere. Oh, yeah. Very fancy. Oh my God. You and I are going to be friends. I always order like Tito's sodas when I go out. Like that's been my drink. And right now I'm drinking, I am drinking like a vodka soda, but I just found this new, and this is definitely not a spon like an ad. I would love if they sponsored us, but I'm we drinking. Are not sponsored. I'm drinking this new vodka called Equality. They actually donate twenty percent of their profits to LGBTQ funds, like to, to organizations. I saw this at the store, and I was like, I mean, being part of the community, it. I was like, I'm definitely gonna buy this, and it's great. So if you ever find that, Anaya, you should also try it. It's very good vodka, and the proceeds go to the uh, LGBTQ. I they would. I really would. Yes. Yeah, it's perfect. All right. Next question. Next question after that is beach or snow? Beach. Yeah. I th everyone it took a while, that. though, to respond. Were you not sure? Well, no. I had to think about it because I don't like the sand because it takes months for it to get out of your yes. shoes. Yes. So it. true. So true. You know what I mean? But I live in New York and the snow is brutal. Yes. Yeah, you're used to the snow. That's true. We had a guest from New York yeah. last week and she was like, definitely not the snow because like, if you live in New York, you hate the snow. If you live at a resort, yes. maybe you like the snow. But Right. Yeah, I love to look at it, uh, but no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, next question. Headline or opener? You know, I don't mind either way because I'm going to sing the same way with the same zeal and the same spirit. So you can put me anywhere. Just let me sing. <laughs> yeah, see, I great love that answer. It's a great answer. So true. All right, last question. All right, the last one is, what is on your rider? Oh, on my rider, I'm going to go and say <laughs> vodka. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's very true. Vodka and my 
agent put, he had starbursts on there. He put that in the middle of the rider because it means if we walk into my dressing room and we see starbursts on my desk, he knows that they've read the contract. Oh, because I love that. The middle. As, and we walk in and if we see that, he goes, they read it. So we're going to have a good night. If we don't see it, he's like, Ugh. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is genius. That's right. brilliant. Yeah, I changed it and made it like halls or uh, <gasps> Ricolas or something because I don't need the Starburst, but yeah. the after my show, I could use something to soothe my throat. So we changed it to um, Ricola, I believe. Oh, wow. That is smart. So Jess has got these weird, she's been accumulating, like whilst we're doing the podcast in quarantine, we've been adding to her... <laughs> Her little rider, which is growing and growing to the point where she will never be booked again. So I guess we're adding Starburst in the Now all, I'm going to be like in the middle. <laughs> Starburst, and if they don't have it, I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> Just kidding. But, yeah. I, but I love the idea and of so putting the, it in the middle. Only the strawberry ones. Only, only the strawberry. Stra- because those are the only, let's be real, those are the best ones, right? So yeah. if you have those yeah. on the rider, it has to be just the strawberry, right? <laughs> Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could. <laughs> She's Alice, like, she was just a stinker. We can't stand her. She's such a diva. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's basically why Jess is not going to have any gigs after this. Because someone told us, I can't remember which guest it was, but they said they put socks on the rider. Oh, it was Kay, uh, Kay, Kay Hanley, Hanley from she was... Lettuce to Cleo. She's, she put socks on the rider and we're like, that's genius. Maybe you could put that in the middle as well. <laughs> yeah, socks. Well, because when you're on tour, if you're on tour for like two months, months you don't think about things that are like that's great to have socks <laughs> that you're like oh wait I don't have to do laundry for a little bit or like <laughs> you know that's very true right yeah. so, yeah. suddenly mm. Anaya's rider gets changed no too. but Anaya's is great because that's so true like okay. they're right about it. if you put something in the middle they are like we have that that means okay it's gonna be great they paid attention to every little detail yeah but halfway through yeah wow oh. exactly well that's awesome thank you so much much, Anaya, yes, for you. spending the time chatting to us. We've just bloody loved it. I'm in awe of you. You're amazing. Yeah, you're amazing. You really are. You're incredible and, and I'm just very excited and uh, for for our listeners uh, to be able to keep in touch with you and, and see what you're up to, would you want to let us know like maybe your social media handles, like your Facebook, uh, maybe your Instagram, Twitter, anything that you're most active on that people could follow you? Sure. You can always find me at Inaya Day, I-N-A-Y-A Day on Twitter, on Instagram, and then on Facebook, you would put Inaya Day Music. So I'm easy to find. If you put in an eye a day, a bunch of stuff will come up and I can't hide. Very (laughs) easy to find. Very easy to find. And you're incredible and seriously cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much. It was so amazing talking to you. We're very honored to have you on the show. So thank you so, so much. You guys. You guys are awesome. It was so easy and fun. I mean, you can call me in any time. Let's just (laughs) fucking hang out. On We'll just just hang out the next time. We'll talk over the phone and just do a little hang. Yeah, we love that. (laughs) I'm with that. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, Anaya, and we loved having you. 